Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. I love a good scandal. When I think of the word scandal, I usually think of celebrity drama or small town gossip, people sleeping with people they shouldn't be sleeping with or embezzling money. You know, things that, while might be considered wrong, don't necessarily really hurt people on the level that we see here in the true crime community. I don't think of a scandal as being necessarily murderous, but they absolutely can be. And I know I'm not alone in this. We as a society are really interested and obsessed with other people's business. England has the royals, love them or hate them. America has the Kardashians, love them or hate them. We have celebrities, we have dueling billionaires, which is a particularly disturbing new dislike of mine. And we just have a desire to know what's going on in other people's lives. But the truth is, not all scandals are lighthearted drama or small town gossip. Some scandals are dark, some are insidious, and some are downright disturbing. And that's the kind of story I have for you today. This is one of those stories that makes me wonder what in the actual hell is wrong with some people. Sometimes it's easier for me to wrap my head around a psychopath killing people than it is regular folks doing despicable things. And it doesn't get any more despicable than the acts committed in today's story. This is a ghoulish story of greed and callous behavior by people we entrust with one of our most sacred acts, the act of taking care of the dead. This is the story of the tri-state crematory scandal. I'm your host, Stacy Lee. Let's get into it. Nineteen seventy five. This is Noble, Georgia, a tiny little unincorporated town that sits closer to Tennessee than most cities in Georgia. Noble, Georgia is so small, it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. There's no town council page, no website, and not information online at all. It's in Walker County, and in all of Walker County, there's only 67,000 people. This is a very, very rural part of the United States. I tried pulling up some images of Noble and of Walker County, and yeah, there's just very little online. But in this little tiny town, if it's even officially a town, sat a crematorium. It was called the Tri-State Crematorium because it serviced three states, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. The crematorium was founded in the 1970s by Tommy Marsh, who was a very well-respected businessman in the area. Tommy had great relationships with all of the funeral homes in that tri-state area, and people were very comfortable using Tommy's services to dispose of their deceased loved ones. For many years, the crematorium operated without incident. Tommy Marsh even ran for coroner at one point and only lost by like 100 votes. He was well liked and his business took in bodies and the ashes were returned to the family members and all was well. Until Tommy Marsh turned the business over to his son. We're going to get into all of that. Now, for the sake of transparency, I know very, very little about cremation. Most of you know I was born and raised in the Mormon church. I'm no longer Mormon. And now I will most likely be cremated. Well, it's either that or a Viking funeral. <laughs> In Mormonism, you're taught that at the second coming of Christ, your spirit will be reunited with your corpse. And that's why you're supposed to be buried and not cremated. In fact, I didn't even know there was a crematorium here in Southern Utah until a very sad event happened when I was in my mid twenties. As I've said before, I started and operated a large dance school here in St. George for many years. And I've since sold that school, but I had this little adorable student and her mom just died at work one day, had an aneurysm and died. She wasn't even 40, I don't think. And they asked me if I would sing at her funeral. And when I entered the mortuary where the casket would normally be, well, normally you'd be in a Mormon church. So it was different to have it in a mortuary. I guess they weren't Mormon, but where the casket would normally be, there was just a table with an urn. And I was like, oh, this is new for me. And I was like in my twenties at that point. When I tell you guys I grew up sheltered, sheltered. 
So cremation is not something I grew up around or know anything about, but it's very common in other places in the United States. And I think in more modern times, it's a much more common choice than it ever has been before. Most people in my circle now say that they will choose to be cremated. That also makes it big business. The funeral business in general is huge. I looked it up. Here in the US alone, the funeral industry makes about $20 billion a year. It is a very lucrative business. Now, I do have experience with a funeral home. In about 1983 or 84 sometime, my father bought a building in Cedar City, Utah that was a funeral home, a mortuary, and he then remodeled it and turned it into his legal offices. When my dad bought the mortuary, part of our job, he has four daughters, I'm the oldest, uh, he took me and my mom and we were gonna clean it. So he takes us there each night after he finishes at work, every night for the first couple of weeks to kind of clean it out before the remodelers come in. And we're like cleaning out this old mortuary. It was creepy as hell. And I kind of can't believe that we did this, but I will never forget cleaning out the embalming room. This is where I kind of started to get interested in the death process and dying and what happens to us. The embalming room in the mortuary was this kind of sickly mint green color of tile, floor to ceiling tile, so it can all be hosed down, and you know, like hospital green. And there was this huge table in the middle of the room. So I'm like 12 or 13 at this point in time. I've never even seen an R-rated movie. This was small town 1980s Utah, so stay with me here. It was a different planet. But the table had like these ditches, like little canals that ran all over it and then corners in it with holes like, like a pool table. And all of the little canals, the little ditches that went around it were stained with this Pepto-Bismol pink color. For my foreign viewers, Pepto-Bismol is this stuff right here. You take it when you have indigestion and it's that color of liquid. It's just Pepto-Bismol pink. I later found out that was the embalming fluid. So I'm off on a tangent, I know, but you will never ever forget the first time you see something like that. And I didn't. In this embalming room, there were a couple of homemade cabinets and they were painted that same sickly hospital mint green color. And overhead, there's like a flickering fluorescent surgical type light. It was just kind of out of a horror movie, even though I'd never seen a horror movie. But my dad was like, hey, get in there and clean this out. <laughs> They were gonna turn the embalming room into two bathrooms. It was a, quite a big room and they were gonna split it in two and turn it into a men and a women's restroom. So we opened these little cabinets that are in the embalming room and they are packed from the ground to like five feet up with a stack of brown paper grocery sacks full of shoes and glasses and false teeth and there was even a couple of wigs. <laughs> you guys. This was like horrifying. Like one of my sisters like ran out of the room screaming, like dead people's shoes and their eyeglasses. I just remember standing there fascinated. I don't know, there's something really personal about eyeglasses to me. And just seeing that the people that sold the mortuary just left all that stuff in there, you know, they were really used to being around death. You know, they just take the people's glasses off and chuck them in a bag in the cabinet. It was wild to me. I remember standing there for what felt like the longest time and, and back then, you know, there were still old people that wore those horn-rimmed glasses from the 60s. There was a whole bag of those, lots of little old lady shoes, lots of dentures. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's actually a really great memory. I actually don't have a very good memory, but I remember that like it was yesterday. And then there was also this big hydraulic lift in the back of the building that was for loading caskets. So it would go down through the floor of the main building and then into the basement. So like, you know, the ambulance or the hearse or whatever would back up with the body and, and load it onto a gurney and then it would go onto this lift and it would lower down. Well, my dad turned that basement room into the filing cabinet room for all the legal files. And when I went to work for him, I would spend hours and hours and hours down in that room by myself <laughs> filing legal files. And for some unknown reason, still, a couple of years after he bought the building, there was like two or three caskets down there. So I'm just down there like 15 years old filing legal files and then there's some caskets behind me and you know, I've had to clean out an embalming room. This is all starting to make more sense to you now, right? This, this, all this is starting to make more sense. <laughs> So that's just a little crazy story about funeral homes and embalming for you. That Those of you that like to come in the comments and tell me how much you hate me and don't care about my personal stories, you've got something really big to bitch about this week. 
You can see how much I care about that because a lot of you like my little stories and you tell me that. So I'm here for you guys, not for the haters. Coming back around to the story, knowing that I do not know a lot about cremations or about the funeral business outside of that story, I did a lot of research. Funeral homes are places that do embalming and then offer services like caskets and flowers and you can have the actual service there. Mortuaries commonly have a crematorium built into the mortuary. Mortuaries tend to be more industrial, not geared towards, you know, having a service there with a room with a piano to bring flowers to. It's more like you're just going there to deliver the body and then pick up the ashes. Now, not all mortuaries have a crematorium, especially in Utah where it's not common, but most of them do. Each state has different laws regarding the handling and the disposal of dead bodies, but most of them have many of the same regulations. Most, if not all states, disallow the viewing of an embalming by anyone not licensed to perform or assist in one. And there are also a lot of rules about protecting the dignity of the dead, just common sense things. When someone is dead, they are totally in the hands of those taking care of them and respect and privacy and their dignity should be paramount in the funeral industry. That's what we expect. The Tri-State Crematorium there in the South never had any issues with any of those things. They had a great reputation and they did a wonderful job. And then in the mid 1990s, Tommy Marsh turned his successful and reputable business over to his son, Ray Brent Marsh. Tommy's health had been declining, and apparently there was good reason for that. We will talk about that in a moment. It turns out there are some serious health hazards to working in a crematorium. So Ray Brent Marsh takes over for his father. And from 1996 to 2002, over 2,000 bodies were sent to the Tri-State Crematorium for disposal under the direction now of the sun. All bodies are sent to be prepared for cremation. They are placed in what is called a retort. Most of us use the slang word oven, but it's actually called a retort apparently. And it is heated to between 1400 and 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. How hot is that? I looked it up. Molten rock lava reaches about 1600 degrees at its very hottest. So I don't have a science brain, so I have to find things to compare numbers to, but when I think of something so hot that it turns rocks into flowing molten lava, that's hot AF. The cremation process is very hot. It takes from between two and three hours to completely disintegrate a body. And even after that, parts of the body remain. After they burn the body, they take a magnet and they wave it over all that's left to pull out fillings. You know, some people have screws where they've broken a bone, metal plates, things like that. All of that is removed and then all of the bones and chunks that are left, they are taken into a small machine that pulverizes them. It has like a little hand crank. Some of the newer ones are automatic. Think of like a mortar and pestle or a mocajete. There's like a little crank that turns. Like I said, I did see a couple online where they put the pieces in and then they kind of fall and go through a sifter. And then that fine powder that is given back to the families, commonly called the ashes, are put into a plastic bag and given to the family. The family can either keep the ashes in that bag or they can buy an urn to keep them in. It's quite a simple process when you think about it. And it's a process that's been taking place for thousands of years. Well, unbeknownst to anyone in the area, something so ghoulish that it does seem like something straight out of a horror film. It went on and on and no one was the wiser until one day the phone rang at the Environmental Protection Agency offices in Atlanta, Georgia, and what the caller had to say was almost too unbelievable to be true. February 2002. A call is routed to the desk of an EPA agent in the Atlanta, Georgia office. The caller wants to remain anonymous, but they tell this agent that something is very, very wrong at this little rural crematorium in Noble, Georgia. This was not the usual type of call that comes into the EPA offices, but the caller must have been convincing because after the call ended, two agents were sent to the Tri-State Crematorium to investigate. They weren't exactly sure what they were going to find, but the caller apparently had given them enough information to cause great concern. This is what the crematorium looked like back then. These aerial shots give you an idea of just how rural this place is and just how 
unkept the property was that the crematorium sat on. As you can see, it looks kind of like a farmhouse or some type of industrial building just out in the middle of nowhere. There is a lot of debris around the outside of the building. There's no paved parking lot. It's just dirt. And there are bushes and trees and overgrowth around it. There are several buildings on the property and there are old vehicles. Some appear to be almost like junkyard cars. In fact, the place almost looks like a salvage yard of some kind. The EPA officials were walking around the property and they had some idea of where to look. The caller had given them some direction. So they're walking around the property in these bushes and these trees and they are absolutely horrified to stumble upon a pile of human bones and a skull just laying out in the open behind the crematorium. There isn't a lot of public information as to what happened on that day. We don't know if they confronted Ray Brent Marsh, if there was a discussion, but we do know that the officials took the bones into their custody and went back to Atlanta. They contacted the sheriff in charge of Noble and the surrounding area and began to gather more information. Apparently, the sheriff had also received a couple of complaints from a propane delivery truck driver long before the EPA was ever contacted by the anonymous caller. There was a man who, on his regular delivery route, would take propane to the crematorium, I'm assuming to fuel the fires at the crematorium, and he called the sheriff more than once and said to the sheriff, I just want you to know that I've seen bodies laying outside on the ground at the crematorium. This man was probably shocked and traumatized and wondering if he'd really seen what he had seen. But when the sheriff went out to check on this, at least this is according to the sheriff, he said nothing was amiss. He said he'd gone out every time there was a complaint and hadn't seen anything. Now, you make of that what you will. This is a small town in the south. We all know the stories of law enforcement down there. I'm not saying anything is amiss, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not possible. For the next week, the EPA officials continue to gather evidence and they obtain a warrant for the property. On February 15, 2002, they arrive back at the Tri-State Crematorium. And this time, they're prepared to do a much more thorough search. Oh, this is honestly just horrible. It's a horrific story. I remember when this happened. I'm sure many of you do as well. And it's still difficult to believe this is all real. The EPA officials, having procured a warrant, begin opening up the buildings that sit on the property. First, they come to a large shed. They open the shed doors and are stunned by what they see inside. There are decomposing human bodies in piles stacked on top of each other. One of the investigators later said, I remember standing there in total silence after we realized what we were looking at. No one said a word. I think we were all in shock and this was just the beginning. The EPA officials and the police then spread out across the property. Again, I'm going to show you some aerial shots of that property so you can get a feel for what they were dealing with. In every corner, behind every building, under every tree, were rotting human corpses thrown about the property as if they were discarded trash. Then the investigators saw the pile of caskets that you can see here. Inside some of these caskets were decomposing bodies as well. There were shoes thrown out into the weeds. There were jackets and eyeglasses and even some wigs, items that belonged to the dead, to people who assumed that when it was their time to go, they would be treated with dignity and respect. And instead, they ended up thrown in the bushes outside a rundown crematorium. Even while the investigators were still at the property going through everything, a local funeral home director, a man who had suspected something strange was going on for a while, called WAGA Fox 5 in Atlanta and told reporter Dan Ronan's team that there was something big happening at the crematorium. The news team rushed to the site and broke the story that evening. Dan Ronan told his station that this would be one of the biggest stories they ever covered and that it would be, quote, on the front page of the New York Times and the lead story on the evening newscasts. He was not wrong. Word of Friday's gruesome discovery in Noble is spreading fast throughout Walker County. It's a topic that has people at this local coffee shop speaking out. I think it's the talk of the town. It's kind of nasty, to be honest me. Newspapers are going fast at local gas stations where the story is once again front page news. 
it's, you know, really sad that this stuff is really happening and the small town will fit, you know, it's kind of awkward. Folks living in Noble say they hope Brent Marsh receives a hefty penalty for a crime so many of them still don't understand. It's really sad and I think the guys should have to serve a year for everybody they find. It's a Ray Brent Marsh has been called a dead man walking. Family members of the ones found at the Tri-State Crematory are angry. Some are fighting mad. Oh, if he gets out, eventually one of these days he's going to get what he deserves. And so will the rest of them. Letha Shropshire's mother was the second body found at the crematory. She says she wants Marsh to see her pain and her deceased mother. I pulled my shirt down so he could see. No, I wouldn't lunge at him because I know I couldn't get to him, but I wish they would put me in a room with him. Other family members share in her anger. They too feel the charge of theft by deception is not good enough. He is no more than a serial killer. I realize these people have already passed away, but they still had souls. They were they were our family, and he needs to be treated as a serial killer. The Walker County Sheriff's Department has received numerous death threats toward Brent Marsh and the rest of the family. Some say perhaps the safest place for him is behind bars. Others say that's not even safe. In Walker County, Ashley Page, News 12. Dan Ronan and his team ended up staying in Noble for a month covering this massive story. Investigators brought in experts from the CDC to ensure that no one on the scene was exposed to dangerous chemicals or substances. They even brought in a federal disaster team to start going through this ghoulish site and they were trying to determine how to clean it up. You have to think about all of that human waste, the tissue, the blood, the intestinal material that was leaching into the ground. There, this wasn't a couple bodies, this was piles and piles of bodies. And there was concern that it might be getting into the groundwater and therefore the drinking water. Like imagine you're a resident in this area and you find out that you might have been drinking water that's full of human waste. This was a massive cleanup effort. The federal disaster team had actually shipped in a portable morgue from Maryland, very similar to what ended up being used later on in the pandemic. When you would see pictures of the pandemic and they'd have those kind of portable tents set up that had crematoriums in them, especially in countries like India, that's what they brought in to start disposing of the waste and burning the bodies. Team members began the slow and painstaking process of trying to identify the remains of all these people before they could be destroyed. You guys, there ended up being 339 bodies just laying in piles behind this crematorium. 339. Not 20, not 50, not 100. You know how many bodies that is? That would be like the entire graduating class of a mid-sized high school just piled up behind a building. So think of like a graduation, a high school graduation, all the kids that are sitting there to graduate. That's how many people, I mean, it's a lot of people. The public was clamoring for information. Of course, any family member who had taken a loved one to be cremated at Tri-State Crematorium was in a panic, wanting to know if the ashes they had been given were ashes or just dust of some kind. Were their loved ones out laying in the dirt all this time? when they thought they had been respectfully disposed of. It was absolutely something that I'm sure it was hard to wrap their heads around. You think of someone dying in your family, you think they're buried, and then you find out later they're not buried, or you think they've been cremated, and you find out later on their body is like, I mean, in a field. It is, whew. As we were uncovering uh, and opening a sealed concrete vault, uh, we discovered, uh, one concrete vault uh, stuffed or packed with more human remains. A large garage type building was found today filled to the top with decomposing human remains. Authorities have found five more vaults in other buildings and other vaults in the woods. So far, 92 sets of remains have been recovered, only 16 of which have been identified. And some of these remains date back decades. And we have, I know. We have found uh, some mummified bodies that I would easily say are between 10 and 20 years old as far as having been buried and then uh, you know, taking that long to get to this particular point. Authorities say most of the remains are from older people who died of natural causes, but some of them were only infants. We have found one definite set of infant remains, though, 
and there are also some other areas that we are ex examining right now that appear to have uh, at least one small casket that would be an infant, infant type that has fallen apart. Just yesterday, Ray Brent Marsh was arrested on five warrants for theft body deception. But a magistrate judge has since released Marsh on a $25,000 bond. Authorities say as time goes by, more warrants will be taken, but body identification must be made first. There is no logical explanation for having vaults filled with human remains and for having caskets dumped you know, in the dirt and decaying and falling apart with more piled on top and more piled on top. Now, of course, many of these bodies were in very advanced states of decomposition. Some of them were mostly skeletonized. The Marsh family quickly hired attorneys to defend them, and those attorneys later became critical of the methods used by investigators, but that was just kind of a diversion tactic. That was far from the leading concern. The weeks and then the months wore on, and when it was all said and done, 226 of the 339 bodies were identified. That is not a great number. That is a number that leaves a lot of people wondering if their loved ones were cremated or not. But then after that process, it was time for the litigation to begin. March, 2003. A class action lawsuit was filed against the Marsh family and Tri-State Crematorium for breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, fraud, negligence, interference with human remains, mishandling of corpses, infliction of emotional distress, and just about anything else you can imagine. I found the actual case filing online, and just the list of plaintiff's names alone is pages and pages long. This class action suit also named many defendants, those being, of course, the crematorium, but also many of the funeral homes that sent the bodies to the crematorium. Ray Brent Marsh was arrested and wisely began asking to negotiate a plea deal. During those negotiations, Marsh was asked why he did what he did. Cremating a body is not a whole lot of work. The body is simply brought in from the funeral home. It's on a gurney. All the crematorium workers have to do is slide it from the table into the retort, seal it up, and start the fire. Investigators said it was actually much more work for Marsh to haul the bodies out into the back part of the crematorium property and throw them out there than it was to burn them. So they didn't understand what the excuse was going to be. Investigators also wanted to know what on earth was in the boxes that had been given to the families in place of the ashes that were never created because the bodies were never burned. Marsh told them crushed up concrete. So not only did he have to haul the bodies out into the backfield and throw them away, he had to pound up concrete with a hammer or something into a fine powder in order to have something to give the families in place of the ashes. It was 10 times more work for him than just cremating the bodies. So why on earth did he do this? Investigators asked if the retort was broken. Maybe that's why Marsh did this. His attorney jumped on that and said, yes, it was old and it was problematic and it was difficult. So the investigators tested it and it worked fine during every single test. This retort was in perfect working condition. Police were puzzled and scratching their heads as to why on earth a man would behave in this way. And the worst part of it is we never really got an answer. Ray Brent Marsh never gives us any solid reasoning. He simply says he doesn't know why he did what he did, and then he offers an apology. What I'm telling you right now is that I'm apologizing. I can't give you the answers that you want. Ray Brent Marsh may never give victims of the Tri-State Crematory the answers they want, but he is going to be punished. Judge James Botterford sentenced him to 12 years in prison. I think we did as much as we could. Um, as best as we could, and um, I thank Jesus for the strength for going through this. I think if he serves the full 12 years, I'll be happy. If he doesn't, I hope Tennessee picks him up and puts him under the jail. Burn in hell with the rest of his family that knew about it. That's Burn right. in hell. And he's scum. The 12-year sentence comes after Marsh pled guilty to 787 counts of abuse of a corpse, theft, fraud, and making false statements. Nearly three years after investigators found the remains of 334 uncremated bodies, family members of the victim say they'll never forgive Marsh. You don't do, you don't hurt my family and me forgive you for it. Not like that. That's for my mother. I will always remember my mother. 
and the tears I've shed because of what Brent Marsh has done to our family and to my mother. Letha Shropshire says she doesn't believe Marsh's apology. The day must start the healing. I ask forgiveness for my sins. Whether you give it or not, I cannot make you do. It was crap. Plain and simple crap. He's had a lot of time to fix his apology, to write his apology to the families, and it didn't mean a thing. While in prison, Marsh must write a letter of apology for each of the bodies discovered. When I get my letter of apology from him, I'm going to write to him personally and ask him, beg him, please tell me why you did this. All anybody wants to know is why. In February of 2007, Ray Brent Marsh's attorney came forward claiming that new psychological testing indicated that Marsh was the victim of mercury toxicity. Remember earlier when I said there are some dangerous side effects to working in a crematorium? Apparently, because most bodies have mercury fillings in their teeth, when that mercury is heated to 1800 degrees, it gives off gases. Those gases are very toxic and this old crematorium was not well ventilated. Marsh's attorney went on to say that not only Brent Ray Marsh, but his father were victims of long-term mercury poisoning and had toxic levels of mercury in their bodies. I looked and I looked and I could not find a report showing those levels. That's not to say they don't exist. That's just me saying I couldn't find anything. In 2005, Ray Brent Marsh was sentenced to 12 years in prison for the mishandling of the human remains and for fraudulently accepting payment for services never rendered. He did his time and he was released in June of 2016. This is what he looked like at the time of his release. As part of his sentence, as you saw in the video clip, Marsh was told to write letters to each of the victim's families. In 2012, he actually wrote a letter to the public. This is the letter that he penned and it reads in part, I humbly and very respectfully acknowledge the hurt and pain my actions have caused. I sincerely apologize. As Marsh sat in prison, the class action suit went forward. It was eventually settled for $36 million, but the settlement then fell apart. All of the buildings on the property were razed, the crematorium and the surrounding buildings were demolished. A second civil trial was held in August of 2004 and ended with a judgment against the Marsh family for $80 million. Insurance companies then stepped in and settled many of the claims, and at the end of it all, about $18 million was paid out. Now here's something I found very surprising. There has never been a large budget film made about this story. After it happened, I waited, thinking surely someone would jump on this ghoulish event and turn it into a movie, but it's never happened. Some film students did make a small budget film called Sakanaga in 2001, but to date, no documentary, no major motion picture, and that really surprises me. There was an episode of Law & Order and an episode of CSI inspired by these events, but I would love to see a documentary on it. You can watch some clips from Shakanaga here on YouTube. I couldn't find the movie from start to finish, but I found some of those playlists that have clips of it. It's old, it's very low budget, but that's all that's been done really. We talk a lot here on Dining with Death about why people do the things they do. Motivation is a big part of why many of us are fascinated with true crime stories. We want to know what makes people tick, and I really want to know what made Ray Brent Marsh tick. The research on this story left me feeling unsatisfied. Not only has he never said why he committed these acts, but it doesn't seem like anyone has really pushed him for answers in many years. If anyone out there knows him and he would like to talk to me, I will go wherever he would like me to go to have a conversation. I want to send love from our community here at Dining with Death to the families that were affected by these events. I really can't even begin to imagine what they've been through and I hope they're healing the best way they can. This isn't your classic true crime story, but crime comes in all shapes and all sizes and so do the people that commit them. Even though this is a different type of story than we usually cover here, the outcome is very much the same for me. Why? When people have so many choices and so many things going for them, do they choose to do such destructive and terrible things? I don't think we will ever know. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death True Crime Tuesday. 
Please like the video, hit the little like button if you would, and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me. The other thing you can do to really support our community is join my Patreon. There you will help support the channel, make it possible for me to continue, and in the end we want to raise money to make donations to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that cannot be tested because there's no money to test it. We want to test that DNA to solve the case it's associated with, but also to get that perpetrator's DNA in the system. Maybe they've committed other crimes. By joining Patreon, you can help us reach that goal. I want you to know how much I appreciate you. My little show here is growing and I wouldn't still be doing this if it wasn't for you guys. So thank you so much. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay safe and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.